Welcome back to the Transform Your Mind, Transform Your Life radio podcast and television show. I'm your host, Life Coach Marnie Young, and sitting in the guest chair today is Audrey Cabanencia. Oh, wow, I did that. <laughs> good job, good job. Yeah, yeah, I did that, I did that. Yes, that's awesome. All right. Yeah, Audrey is a leadership expert, and today we're going to be discussing the topic, how to free yourself from the imposter syndrome as a leader. Welcome, Audrey. Thank you. Yes. All right. Well, Audrey is a fellow podcaster, so she's a pro. So let's, <laughs> so let's dive right in. All right. So um, let me give you a little more information on Audrey. Audrey Cavanencia um, is the co-producer and co-host for the Amplified Voices podcast alongside NFL coach Pete Carroll and host of the Unlikely podcast on leadership. A talented storyteller and visionary, Audrey has decades of experience in leadership development, entertainment production, and content marketing with a focus on championing humanity in all people. She has worked Mm -hmm. alongside some of the most influential leaders in the world, including speaker and author Tony Robbins, my favorite person, Mm-hmm. And Oracle founder Larry Ellison to develop and empower new visionaries through stories and insights around authentic human connection. No matter the sector, she continues to build bridges between what is and what can be with storytelling as the scaffolding. Awesome, Audrey. You know, um, I was listening to a show uh, once, and the guy was talking about the top two. I think he, he talked about the top three storytellers, and I can only remember two. He talked about Les Brown and um, Joe Osteen because they're mm-hmm. people that are classic storytellers. And I started to try to hone my storytelling skills as well because right now storytelling has become an art and it's yes. becoming how people, you know, share their story because your story is always the background of your work. You know, people need to connect with you. And I usually start off my show by asking the same kind of question here. What was your journey to becoming a leadership expert? And storytelling, here it comes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, it's it's interesting because I grew up, uh, I was born in Oakland, California. And I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I have uh, this pretty much the extreme polar opposites of parents in every sense of the word. My mother is white. And when I say white, I mean white, like blonde hair, blue eyes, can't even tan white from Germany. And so she came here when she was about 12. And then my father is African Latin from South America. So dark skin, kinky hair, all the features. And you know, you think of that kind of German culture and you think of that kind of African Latin culture, and those are total polar opposites as well in so many ways. And then on top of it, here's two people totally dramatically different, came here to the United States. So now they're dealing with the American culture, a whole other one. They meet in church and, you know, many years later, five children later, we each of each of us siblings are a roll of the dice of that race of that mixture of of all of that. So I think we started out, especially for myself, started out very, very early being forced almost to be an observer of society because I didn't have my my tribe I couldn't point at somebody and be like, oh, you exactly like me. You know, I couldn't find the Mexican culture and fit in with them. I couldn't, you know, every single person was like, no, nah, Audrey, you're a little bit different. You're, you're a little bit on the outside. And maybe it wasn't even them. Maybe it was just me and my own perception of where do I fit when I come from these two narratives that are so different. And then I live inside of my own Americanization while still being pulled into both of their cultures, different languages in the household. I mean, imagine all of this, right? So my dad, like many people in other countries, fell in love with the cinema. And he would spend every little, you know, penny he had to go and when he was a kid and watch movies. And most of those movies were white people. Mm. So when he came to the United States, 
Mary's a white woman, <laughs> you know? So it's another layer for me to look at and be like, oh, am I not beautiful? Because my father didn't even marry somebody who looked like me. What does that mean about me? I looked into the movies that he watched and I thought, oh, what does that mean about me? None of these women look like me. Mm -hmm. Looked into, you know, going into careers. My parents own their own business, like a lot of people that come from other countries. What does it mean about, you know, just there's this constant thing when you think of ourselves when we're young. And so my first foray into just a self-expression and finding myself was to be in the theater because I thought, in that place, I can pretend because I have no home. I have no tribe and I can be anything. And even then they wouldn't cast me because they were like, what are you? <laughs> I don't know what you are. Where do we fit you? No, but anyway, I did. I uh, toured. I did saying, yeah, you know, they're not black enough for a robe and they're not white enough for a That's robe. Right. Yeah. That's right. And but I did have some extraordinary experiences. I toured with the um, at worked uh, inside of the um, African Repertory Theater in Berkeley, toured with plays. Uh, with individuals, was on uh, the Wayans Brothers show. So I had a great time being inside of storytelling, but, and here's my lead into leadership, but I noticed that I still felt at the effect of other people's stories. I didn't have my own. Mm. And so I went to- you just didn't embrace it. You got a great story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, I went to a leadership development in my 20s. I went to a leadership development course and there was something about it. It had the the beauty of theatrics of being on stage. It had that that spiritual kind of nature of going to church and kind of feeling that physiological kind of feeling that you have in your chest and your heart and everything opens up and you feel that cleanness that you go through. And it also had this power of being able to impact other people. You know, you interact with people as a course leader, as a trainer, as a coach, right? And you mm -hmm. can, you feel the navigation going through shifting their energy. And I fell in love and I thought, I want all of this, all of it. And I threw myself in. I, I dedicated all my time to it. I was a single mom at that time as well. But what I learned along the way, and I was getting trained by guys that were former Navy SEAL guys that were in executive coaching. I mean, there was some rough rough people that, you know, barely the guys could make it through. And I was the only woman a lot of times. And there was this moment did where I just kept training. I'm sorry. Did the physical training like the no, no. A lot of former people in military end up getting in coaching and executive coaching because of the rigor that it's, right. it naturally is a translation to say, uh, you know, we had to account for something. Yeah, the yes. Right. And also mm -hmm. that they surrender to a team. They know what that experience is. If I make a choice, it's not my choice. That choice affects the whole team. And that's what you get in when you start building with cultures and, and high-level C-suite executive coaches and training. So, so it attracts a lot of those former people that have that kind of structure of discipline. And so I rose through the ranks. I, I became a really, really successful leader in that regard. And then one woman said something to me in like my pathway to keep rising through the ranks of executive coaching. And she said, Okay, great. So what? You can be a superstar, but can you create other superstars? And I thought, why? Isn't the whole point of competition to be the best? Why would I want to develop people to be better than me? But it really stirred something in my heart, in my soul. It spoke to something that was way down deep there, which was being a champion for humanity. Mm -hmm. And now I threw myself into this whole other training and development. And that was... I want to do everything possible. The people that have failed, the people that no one can turn around, the people that have given everything and couldn't find themselves, the shy people, the introverts. I want to, I want to pull all of them and make them the best leaders in front of crowds. I want to make them the best public speakers. And eventually I did. And that's when people like Tony Robbins and all those others started searching me out and having me work inside of their intellectual property. And at some point I got to, again, a point where I had fulfilled some calling. I'd fulfilled some point of purpose in my path. And then I knew I had this insight and I listened in my heart and in my mind. And it said, now bring those two things together, bring storytelling that you did in the entertainment business and bring this training to champion people and make them better at their own purpose and voice, bring them together 
and you're going to have something unique. And I did I opened my own agency and it took off from there. And I've worked with some of the biggest names out there. And now I really get up underneath people. And I do, I, I not only champion them and rise them up and help curate and formulate their voice and their audience and all of that, but I combine it with their actual content. So now I'm in publishing and now have this media company with Pete Carroll and we're pulling in people right and left and it's called Amplify Voices for a reason because we're going into the margins of leadership, the representation that hasn't happened, the kind of voices that really we need to expand what leadership is, what it looks like, what size it is, what color it is, what its hair looks like, what its nose looks like, what its, what its voice sounds like, where it lives, what it does, its temperament, its emotions, all of that. We need more expansive view of, of leadership because there's so much to accomplish in the world. That's beautiful. Wow. That's beautiful. I never heard it, you know, you know, you know, illiterate, you know, spoken quite like that. You know, I um there's so many, there's so many nuggets in there. One, yeah, um, uh, you know, your 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 parenting and and your dad and your mom and it's it's beautiful to say that your, you know, your mom is, you know, German, blonde, blue eyes. And, um, you know, one of the beautiful things of that kind of a merger is the children are beautiful and you're beautiful. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, and um, I, I, I love how you, um, uh, you found your voice through media and entertaining and in theater and um, and now you're helping people to tell their story. So with the amplified voices and oh, I I love what you said. What a leader looks like, smells like, tastes like, mm -hmm. you know, what is his voice? That is that is so personal. That's so beautiful. So the amplified voices. If I were to circle back on that question, is um, are you allowing people to tell their story, or is that what the voices mean? The voices means that um, right now we're focused on podcasts, podcasting. So I'm I'm finding particular people out there that have a voice. And a lot of times, again, but because of the norm of like, oh, that's a leader. We're going to put effort behind that person. We're going to put them in the news. We're going to write about them. We're going to invite them on shows. You see that happen so much because of the stereotypical view of what right. they think is. Pete right. and myself and the team, we believe in the expansive view and expanding the narrative. So we're looking for voices that are timely, that are important. Like, for instance, Resma Menicum. He's the writer of My Grandmother's Hands, African-American male who specializes in the area of body trauma and says that, you know, here we are in the world. We're asking people to be together. We're asking people to work on their divisiveness. We're asking people to work in their business environments. We're asking them to be great parents, but we have not confronted the trauma that lives in our bodies, especially Black bodies. But Black bodies are not the only ones who experience trauma. White bodies, like, like to his point, he says, before Black people were enslaved, they were enslaving white people. It's in our history. And yeah. so it informs us, this pain, this this fear from one another. You know, you look in the world right now, we, we feel Resma is such an important voice because you look in the world right now and you see so much hate, but what I see is fear. Yeah. I see people terribly afraid. If we give money to the poor, that means we as rich people will have less money. That's fear. That's fear yeah. talking. That's not abundance talking. That's not the ability of how miraculous and amazing a human being is constructed to create and design absolutely anything. When you speak in those limiting have and have nots ways, which leadership, a lot of it has been trained inside of, lead yeah. to win. When you win, that means somebody else loses. There's really has been that that narrative for us for so long. And then we start comparing ourselves to other people. So these voices with, with Resma and, and trauma and other ones that we have found, we feel that they're important voices. You know, they are out there. They have their, their, their tribe. They have their books, you know, going out. But we really want to, especially Pete as a white male, a white powerful male who's successful in the world. He, he says, I can't speak in behalf of these communities. I don't even want to. I'm trying to learn from them. But what I can do is give my platform. I can do whatever I can to give them and turn over my platform. And then, you know, as his partner, I'm here to say, hey, I do understand those worlds. I, I've been in those around those things. I've known what it's felt like to have my, my voice suppressed. But now my voice, 
my, my inability to find my voice is now my greatest voice because it gives me compassion for what other people go through, where I can see what would have been supportive. A lot of people can't see that when they've had privilege in the area of being put up on a pedestal or being seen as a leader before those of us that don't look that way are seen mm-hmm. as leaders in our communities. So so Amplified Voices right now is focused on podcasting. So what we do in the in the tactile sense of the, the um, uh, term, what we do is we find people that ha- that are out there speaking, whether they have a book or, or they're um, um, a public speaker or they're doing workshops with businesses or a community leader or something just kind of where we feel it's really powerful. I approach them. I have dialogue with them. And if I feel there's a real sense of, uh, synergy there and collaboration, and they're on board for it. We take them over and we start developing their content. We become a support for them, not only in the production process and the post-production process and helping them and shaping them better in their brand and also in their marketing. And then we you know, want to take them through those ranks. And then when they get to a certain point, being able to get them right in front of the right people for their book deal or the right thing for a television show or whatever else becomes the natural progression. And not all things will we do with them. There'll be projects that they'll do independently on their own by nature of this collaboration and some things we'll do together. So we, we think that's very important. And so that's what the the company does. We're a, a media production company and also a marketing development company. That's beautiful. It sounds Thank very you. similar to, um, you know, when I when I published um, my book, um, uh, there was a, a company that sponsored me and that's basically what she was doing. She was trying to get the African-American mm-hmm. uh, voices, you know, on a, you know, out there. And that's basically what, she, you know, what she did. She she sponsored the book. I had to pay a very small amount and um, she took over. She coached me on how to write it. She helped me with the cover. You know, she helped me with the editing and the whole thing. And that's basically because she wants African-American women specifically yeah. to be able to tell her story. But now you're, you're giving me a, a, another, another inch of that, you know, amplify their voice. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That that is that is that is awesome. So yeah, well, that's a really great thing that you're doing. A really great thing that you're doing. So that's awesome. Thank you. So um, one of the questions that I have here is, how can we empower leaders to seek authentic human connections? Um, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the story and what leadership looks like. Um, uh, so explain and expand to our listening audience um, what is an authentic human connection. I know that. Human connection is connecting with someone, um, uh, but I, I think that you probably um, have a, a broader definition of it. What is that? I actually have a simpler definition of it. Okay. It's not actually quite broad. It it has depth, but it's actually quite simple, and it's also one of the scariest things possible. So, so there. How about that? Um, but it's 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 not. It's freeing. It's just that little bit of getting past again the the very myopic. Um, interpretation and and narrative we've had around leadership. And it's this, sharing yourself. If you share your, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, it sounds so simple, but think about it. If people just think your listeners are, are listening and just think of the last three days of your work life, of maybe even your relationships, maybe even with your children, just moments where you wanted to say something and you didn't where you felt like you wanted to reveal something and you didn't, where you wanted to ask for help or support and you didn't, whether it was your pride, whether it was your shame, whether it was because of the way you were raised, however it is, we deal with this. It's not a blanket statement or experience. It is a micro moment by moment experience where we do not have the freedom to express ourselves. Then when you put on the label leadership, it's like, no, I can't tell the team I don't know what I'm doing. They won't respect me. I can't tell people I don't know how to meet payroll at the end of the week. They will leave. I can't tell people that, you know, I'm putting on this big presentation on social media, but in the background, I'm suffering and I'm questioning myself or I have an eating disorder or I'm maybe drinking too much because of the stress and the pain or things I went through. I can't possibly say that, but it truly is 
an accurate statement to say the truth will set you free. But the other part of it in leadership is it won't just set you free. It will actually allow people to grow inside of your leadership. It is the greatest possible thing that you can do. Because think of this, how can you get the best of people when you yourself as the leader are suppressed? Yeah. You are essentially raising other suppressed people. How can you get the best of your children when they can't? Right? Yeah. Go ahead. One of the one of the things that um, people love about Gary Vanderchuk is because they say mm. that he's very transparent and he comes on and everybody, again, um, uh, storytelling and transparency has become the buzzword because, yes, yeah, transparency means you show people your inner feelings. But, yeah, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a great way now to connect with people because that's what you're doing it for. You're, you're connecting with them through transparency, letting them see your pain, you're letting them see that maybe you're not as confident or something. But yeah, okay. Yes, because at the core is this. We have had so many examples, especially that's been revealed in the last few years with all this cancel culture that's happening most immediately. We have seen that we have been rewarding bad behavior in leaders because they produce results. Mm -hmm. They're running a big company. They're bringing in billions and millions of dollars. They are known and selling those albums and selling those CDs and being the head in that movie and then doing really, really, really bad things in the background, really impacting people's lives. Some of these people for decades, some of these people still are not over and still live in that space of being victimized by these leaders. But they produce great results. So, you know, hey, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a balance. It's not a balance. It's not a balance because we have not seen what's possible to be in a world where we're not forcing with aggression and fear to get results out of people as leaders. What we're doing is when you say transparency and being ourselves, when you share yourself, and I don't mean like, oh my gosh, ever, you know, going around all the time, like you don't know what you're doing. I don't mean like that. I mean, like there is this moment where you can feel you're a bottleneck to the yourself, to the team, something stuck. You don't have freedom. That's the moment to reveal something about yourself, to share, to ask you know, your team to say, I don't know, can we all work together on some solution here? Whatever it is. Because what that does is it builds trust. Mm -hmm. If I see you and I know you, I trust you. If you're over there looking good, like you got it all perfect, then not only do I maybe question you, I question myself. Because I think that's what it must look like to be a leader. And and mm -hmm. and maybe I'm not that. that right, right, yeah? right, right. Trust mm -hmm. is what we need mm -hmm. in the world. It's a missing space and energy. And we've allowed for so long to be this, oh, leave your personal life behind. And when you're a leader, you know, this is what you, you know, you only stay in the business world. You only talk business stuff. It's like, this is, in, this is crazy. This is crazy. I was speaking to a 12 year old the other day because one of the podcasts we're producing is for a host a gentleman named Sean Good, uh, who did a lot of work with um, children in the juvenile system. And he's just amazing. And now I want to take him and I want to expand that out and have all young people and all that. But we, I came up with this idea that what if we have a podcast that interviews parents, educators and the youth? Because that dynamic right there is intertwined by inauthenticity. There's so much they have not been able to say because everybody's trying to figure out the right thing. And that kid's just trying to be heard and seen, you know, parents trying to do their best. The, the teachers don't feel appreciated. And then that kid's in the mix of that whole thing. And I thought this is an amazing dynamic. And so the podcast is called Possibilities Over Problems because a lot of young people are grown up and looked at as problems um, or the teacher's the problem or the parents the problem. But like, what if we all delved into possibility, right? So speaking to in my producing, I, uh, I'm, I interview the guests that come on beforehand to just get the right mix as we're, we're developing. And I was talking to a 12 year old and she was talking about, I said, what is the thing, one of the things that doesn't work for you in school that, that you wish would change? And she said, you know what, one of the, you know, little, little voice, even the 12 year old, she had that little girl voice and it was Penny. She, she goes, you know, she's like, you know, what? one of the things that doesn't work is I feel like I can't be myself at school because sometimes I'm hurting. And the teacher doesn't really care. They just care that I do the work. I said, you know what, Penny? That same thing happens to your mom and your dad and me in work. Yeah. A lot of workplaces don't want to hear us either. And she was like, really? That happens to adults too? And I was like, yeah, we don't want it to happen either. We think it's unfair too. I said, but Penny, this is so important that you'd be sharing this because 
if, if you and young people can change that when you're young, maybe when we're adults, we won't do that to each other either at work. But that gives you an insight, right? How long that's going on. We've all been trained to keep your personal life at home. Yeah. Shove it yeah. down, compartmentalize, and go yeah. be only a fraction of yourself in the world. But give me your best results, otherwise I'll fire you. Come on. <laughs> You're not perfect for compartmentalizing. Yep, yep. Yep. But but I think this is that's a great point. They're mm-hmm. perfect to a degree because when men became more and more in the workforce, what happened? Heart attacks started rising. Mm-hmm. And when women got the rights to start working, you could follow the, the data. When women started going more and more to the workforce, working in, inside of that fight or flight, give me results, I don't care about your personal life, what started happening? An epidemic of heart disease in women. Yeah. So yeah. while men are more built to be compartmentalized, they're not built to stay that way. Right. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's good. So um, uh, so what you're saying is authentic human connection is sharing yourself, letting people see your vulnerable side, and uh, you know, so they can trust you. And that's good. That's actually very good because if you lead that way, then you will definitely. Um, have, you know, another word that everybody is using now or culture, you'll have a, a, a much better culture in your organization if um, you're perceived as that kind of leader. So that's amazing. So that also probably works when you're talking about diversity as well, which I know it's, it's, it's a, big, um, a, a big topic in your work. Um, and, um, you know, we were, you know, explain to someone that's listening um, how does diversity in leadership benefit an organization? Well, it, the, the simplest, and then there's data. Harvard has done studies behind this. There, if this is not like a moral compass conversation. This is actually an e- economic one when you're talking about business, okay? Uh, because I know everybody gets it like, yeah, yeah, we know, we need, we, we need more Black people. We need more. We, we know, we know, we know. And I'm just like, oh, so hold on one second, because that sounds like you're coming at me with a moral compass. I'm not talking about a moral compass. What I'm saying is, look, in the world, there are 6.5 billion people about, let's just say, okay, do you think all those people only like white things? Do you think all those people only want to hear from aggressive, outspoken, bold people? Do you think all those people that resonates for it? No. And you know how we know that's true is because when the internet became something and we were socialized, we see leaders like yourself, like myself, in every type of possible form, having people that watch and listen to them. Yeah, maybe they have a thousand, maybe they have 5,000, maybe they have 300. This is so important. This is what the economy is called uh, the long tail theory, right? We thought, well, we just need to be either your your nobody or your somebody. That's a very, very uh, uh, strong narrative that's been around for a long time. But when the long tail theory came out, the long tail theory was look at a long tail. It has a, a larger part, a middle part, a tiny part and all of that. So actually what the future is really built on is people that have a unique self-expression in the world, just like my story in the beginning. Like that story will resonate for whomever it resonates for, and it won't resonate for whom it does not resonate for. But if you think of 6.5 billion people, there's a good few hundred thousand of people at the very least it'll resonate for. We don't, we no longer need, so this is one part, we no longer need to have such big numbers behind us to validate our worth we really only essentially need to find our tribe and build and expand upon that. That's number one. That's super important. That's, the data is 100% behind that. The second part of why um, solutions and outcomes in the studies that were done require more diversity in leadership is that you're looking at things from different perspectives. And there is no way for someone to be able to have all perspectives embodied in their experience. I don't care if the greatest marketing person or salesperson on planet earth, you still cannot embody all perspectives. But when you start bringing others, this what it allows for, and this is what the data has shown, there is more innovation 
in diversity. Right. And the reason is because if you start hiring people and only have people around you and only listen to people that agree with you, look like you and have your life experience, at some point you're going to be limited on the truth and what's possible. Because this happens to me a lot of times in my consulting days, not in my media days now, but in my consulting days, I'd come in and I'd say, hey, well, this is what I'm thinking. They're like, Audrey, we already did that. And I was like, okay, well, what about not now? We already tried that. Uh, Okay, what about that? No, no, we already did that. And I'm like, okay, but here's the thing. You might have already done it, but somebody who sees the world like me didn't do it with you. I promise you, if I do this thing you already did, but I do it with you, we're going to get a different result. And they're like, okay, let's try it. And you know what? We did. Every single time, 100% of the time. And that is because in a different way, which is just like a ridiculous example, if you're just always using salt on your food and you never use any other spice ever, any different kinds of oils, any garlic, any any parsley, any, any African spices, listen, you don't have a lot of range. Right. You just got salty food and degrees of salt, okay? But if you want to start expanding your palate yeah. and have you this amazing people. senses, yeah, right? Picture that, right? That's yeah. right. That's right. And that's the same thing. Think of your business like expanding your palate. And if you expand your palate yeah. for business, you will reach greater, broader, and more expansive revenue streams. Yeah. Yeah. I actually heard that. Um, I've done a few interviews on diversity and, um, uh, you know, they say exactly that is that, you know, if you have a salesperson, for instance, or anybody in your customer service or any, any facet of your business, um, and you have, um, a different mix of people with different experiences, then of course your business will be better because, um, uh, there are certain people will be, be able to relate better to certain people. And it's, it's just, you're talking about authentic human connection and that's basically a part of it, but you're also added the fact that, um, you know, um, as far as economic goes, then you're also able to reach a wider audience, but you know, as far as customer service and connecting, it's always good to have diversity in 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 the workplace. Okay, so that's awesome. All right. So now, um, you know, we were our topic today is how to free yourself from the imposter syndrome as mm-hmm. a leader, and that's become a big topic. You know, I listen to a podcast myself, and I'm hearing a lot of people now talking about the imposter syndrome, and I understand why you're uniquely qualified to to be an expert on this subject because, again, you were saying that you couldn't find your tribe because you didn't look like your mom or your dad and you're in the middle and, and things like that. So, um, so tell us, basically, um, with your experience um, uh, about imposter syndrome and how leaders can, you know, move away from that. Okay. So I just want to expand on one thing. So you said, you know, that I'm uniquely qualified because of my background and not having found a place where I belong. So one would naturally say, oh, you must have dealt with imposter syndrome a lot and and worked your way through it. But there's a second one, too. So if you look at these men that I work next to, Tony Robbins, Larry Ellison is the seventh richest person on planet Earth has one of the most important, anytime you use an ATM, uh, a traffic light, all that, that's Oracle software in the background. He's mm. one of the most important companies in the world. Um, Pete Carroll, I, I never even watched football. I didn't know if he was when I met him, but for many people, he's not only um, regarded and, and held in some circles as legend, but also he's very unique in the world that he's brought compassion and love to his players and has never been this, you know, tough yelling and, you know, verbally abusing his, his guys. He's, he's very, very compassionate and treats every team member like family. It's very unique in that highly competitive field. So if you ask yourself, how does somebody look that look like Audrey (laughs) get is comfortable with being next to men of this caliber without ever questioning herself or working through questioning herself. Because to me, that's a whole other level. If people want to know how to get diversity, they should be talking to people that have had like my experience as well, that have dealt effectively in that. And here's what I've come to. There's no such thing as imposter syndrome. It is like completely one more ridiculous thing to put in front of us that we have to overcome. Because in my 
reality and my perspective and my view, and I'll say this until the end of time if I need to, the only thing that causes imposter syndrome is the moment you question yourself and then believe it. Because no one's view of you can truly, truly affect you. It's only really your belief that that view is true, where you start to change. Well, a lot of people feel that they have to fake it till they make it. So, you know, you are going... Another horrible narrative that we've been given. (laughs) Oh, my God. Well, when I think of imposter syndrome, I'm I'm thinking of somebody that you you, you mentioned earlier, a leader that um, uh, is stressed and, and they don't know how to handle something but they're pretending that they know how to handle it and they've got it all together, or they they have lots of um, lack of self confidence that they can do jobs, and they're pretending that. So what you said is actually true, um, a great definition because you tell yourself something and you believe it, and you believe that you're an imposter until you work through it. Well, here's the thing. Okay. It's the pretend part that's so damaging. Yes. Because you can't, I mean, unless I'm hiring you to be an actor in a film, okay, there's really nothing beneficial about pretending. Pretending doesn't give you a skill set. Pretending doesn't give trust with the team. Pretending doesn't give you a sense to be free to work through a problem, a solution openly and out loud. Pretending doesn't give you the opportunity to experience the impact of failure and learn from it. Pretending is something where, just think of it, pretending is something where I suppress my natural self-expression. I have this ideal image, which I am not right now. So that in and of itself invalidates my experience of my being in my body right now with other people looking at their eyes while they're counting on me to do something and give them direction. And, and then I'm operating on something but that I don't really know anything about. So first of all, I don't know what I'm doing. And then I pretend to be something that I don't really know if that's the answer anyway. And now you got pretending on top of pretending. Would you think you're going to get some great results? No. People that have pretended and pretended along the way, I would say the only difference is that they were in that uncomfortable, stressful, uh, stressful situation for so long, but they kept working, they kept applying discipline, and eventually they came into their own. That That's okay. I'm going to tell you, a shorter path is just be honest. Because the thing that I got in working with these, especially let's say that somebody gave a scenario, let's say that, you know, you, you, they promote you to this position and you're a leader or, you know, and um, you're not going to tell people you don't know what you're doing. You are going to pretend. Maybe you're going to get coaching on the side. (laughs) I would say, no, I would say, no, I would say, absolutely. Don't do that. If anybody asked me, I would say, don't do that. Here's what you would say. Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm strong at. Here's what I'm not quite clear at. And these are not my strengths. I'd love to hear from you on the team. Or if you're talking to someone more senior to you, I'd love to hear what you would like to contribute to me and how I can set up the right structure that are really leaning on my strengths. Because here's the thing, at the end of the day, people that hired you, this is the thing that I got about the men that I worked with. I mean, just happened to be men. I've just happened to not have worked with a a really, really powerful woman yet. Um, But, um, But the men that I've worked with in their position, the thing that I got when I started at at first feeling that imposter syndrome, what if I'm not enough? What if I don't do what they think I'm going to do? All of that. It's like I had this epiphany one day. They see something in me that I have not met yet. I I just haven't seen that Audrey face to face yet because of my own doubt, because of my past, because of my own criticism, because of my own judgment, because of comparison culture, and because I'm a woman and you're supposed to put all the layers that have been imposed on me that I did not ask for when I came onto this planet. So no, thank you. And the thing that I got was why not surrender into what they see in me instead of what I'm questioning about myself. And so I did. And when you surrender to that, you do naturally ask more questions. So I would sit and I'd say, oh, you know, Larry, what do you see and how me, I could handle this situation. Oh, Audrey, you're so good at this. You should do it like, oh, good idea. I totally see that what you're saying there. I stopped living in my head and I lived out loud. People need to ask more questions. Listen, science is based on inquiry and science gives us innovation. Why are people trying to come up with all the answers when scientists are asking all the questions, when we as human beings should be asking more questions? You want the best from your team? Ask them. You want your children to work with you and be more craft? Ask them what's going on with them. 
Don't make up stories in your own head. Your own stories are informed by your past and your own personal experiences. Get out there in the world. We need to ask, I mean, look at race issues. If if white and black people, especially on the, on for white people that were trying to work through that, don't try and tell us what your perspective is on how we should live our lives. Ask us more questions. Right. Ask. All of this, we, we really should take a big, long, hard look at science and how science lives in the state of inquiry. And if you ask and you ask and you ask, well, what about this? Okay. What about that? Okay. What about that? And you keep asking. There's a point in which you ask so many questions that you pop outside of the current reality. That's called a paradigm shift or right. breakthrough. And when you, ha- when you have that phenomenon, what you do is you see a whole new world. Why can't we do that with ourselves? Why can't we keep saying, oh, Audrey, why are you thinking this way? Why, why would you think so hard on yourself? Where do you think that comes from? Oh, you know what? That comes from how my mom used to talk to my dad. And then I observed it and I thought, oh, okay, well, hey, why don't you create a different way, Audrey? Like, I'll give yeah. you an example. I'm, 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 my son's 30 and I'm right now, we're working through, he works with me. So we work through a lot of not just mom, son, friend, because we're a wonderful friendship part of our relationship. Relationship, but now I'm also boss, employee, you know, that kind of dynamic mentor. He calls me his mentor. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I notice is that I had a way that I learned that when pressure comes on, like you need to produce results or, or revenue or anything that's very, very like urgent, that I become more aggressive and forceful. Like, oh, well, don't you know what you're supposed to do? You know, like, I got kind of like that kind of, <laughs> right? And, 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 I, and I've gotten a lot of results out of that. And when we weren't examining leadership a decade before or two decades ago, whatever, people were like, oh, Audrey, she's like tough. You bring her in and, you know, she'll give you what for and she's a, all that kind of stuff. But now, you know, I'm, I'm transforming. I'm evolving as the world evolves. And I'm looking for that expansive view of leadership. And so I was telling, I was sharing with the team. As you said, he's a. a oh my gosh! Yeah. Like I've learned, I learned from him. I ask him questions. Pete, how do you deal with that? And then I try it on, and I, you know, I try on different things. I'm not making myself wrong. I'm growing. Okay, right. I don't have to have. I don't need to be one note like that salt. I can be many flavors of my leadership, right? And I'm expanding. And I notice that I'm expanding. I notice that my son, when he works in the the breakdown with the sound or the camera, he gets all like, Mm-mm-mm. and I was like, oh, look at that, look at that. I passed it on. Oh, no, 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 no. Right. And so I've been in this inquiry. Where did that come from? How do I equate stress, high levels of stress with force? Oh, that's a natural. No, no, no. It came from somewhere. For me, it came from somewhere. And I look back when my mom, when I was a little kid, it was just me and my sister. And we wouldn't do what we're supposed to. My mom would start slamming cabinets and getting all like that. And her voice would get loud and whatever. And I remember as a kid thinking, ugh. That's awful. I don't want to be this way. And you know what? When you say I don't want to be that way, you usually grow up and being that way because it's a blind spot. Yeah. Because you yeah. thought you didn't want that behavior. Now I have this behavior. And so part of my work that I'm doing now is if I could be any way I want when the stress levels get high, how would I want to be? Well, I would want to be free. I would want to experience joy. I'd want to be like, oh, challenges. Come on, let's go. I want to be creative. I want to get people to rally around and we have fun. Like, of all the different ways we can tackle this one particular challenge. And I'm starting to loosen up this grip that's been on me. To me, that's where what, what's amazing up at this time period that we're in right now with this paradigm shift that we're in in the world is to examine ourselves, to examine what leadership is, to examine what to success is, all of that. So that, that's what I mean by like, I'm asking myself questions. I'm not trying to figure out the answers. I'm trying on different ways of being feeling out different things. And now my son is starting to unravel that too. And I told him, I was like, let's break this cycle so your children don't take this on. I was just about to say that because you pass it on. You know, children um, just watch everything that you do, Mm. everything that you do. And sometimes you're proud. Oh, you know, like I have a daughter that's exactly like me and I'm very proud because she's a good girl and she does a lot of good things. And and I call her, you know, Myrna 2.0. But um, she just <laughs> she cute. just watches everything I do, and um, so yeah, your kids are always watching. So I mean, if there's something that you don't want, you know, to pass on, then you've got to stop that behavior. So yeah, I'm glad yeah. that you are you're conscious of it, and you're conscious of it now because you're in the coaching space and your self improvement space. But most of us, as you know, 
um, 95% of the time we're, we're, um, with, uh, we're in um, autopilot. We don't, never yeah. even notice any of these things. We never right. consciously um, think of any of these things. All right. So as we, um, we try to wind down, um, uh, I know I had a question here that I wanted to ask you, but who um, are your um, greatest role models? Um, as far as imposter syndrome, so maybe you can give me one person that you um, that you felt you know um, uh, broke through the imposter syndrome, and that was one of your greatest years. You probably told told me already about your about Pete and Tony. <laughs> no, actually, I don't have role models. I don't believe in role models. Oh, okay. I, I believe in being inspired by the work that people do and to honor their path in life. But uh, a while ago, about a decade ago, I noticed that that also kept me inside of that comparison world. Like, how did they work through that? And oh, my gosh, what, oh, what age were they? Oh, they already worked through that. And they got to that. Oh, I'm behind. I'm behind with my role model and where they were. Like, I was like, no, thank you. I, I, I really am at the age now where if something has me start to question myself, no, thank you. I'm not interested in it. And maybe role models work for other people. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm not telling other people to do what I'm doing, but I've eliminated anything outside of that has me not live my unique best life. Great, great. You're true. That's awesome. All right. right. Perfect. Great way to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to wrap it up. So tell us, you know, Audrey, this has been a fantastic conversation. I Thank learned you. quite a bit that you expanded my mind. And that's basically why I talk to people. Um, uh, there's a couple of little nuggets and things that you have, you have, um, you know, brought to my attention that I didn't know before. And that's, that's the purpose of a great conversation. And I'm pretty sure that our listening audience and those watching on TV, you know, got a, you know, got a lot of um, inspiration from you on uh, being authentic and, uh, you know, authentic human connections. So that's awesome. So how can people um, connect with you, um, listen to your podcast, and also connect with you in social media? Oh, okay. Well, it's very easy to find us at amplifyvoices.io. So amplifyvoices.io, and you'll find everything there. How to find me, all our podcasts are there, the upcoming podcasts, like I mentioned with Resma or um, with his called Gorilla Muse or uh, Possibilities Over Problems, a young educator or parent one. All of the new ones are coming up. Um, and uh, also my Instagram is easiest. It's uh, My LinkedIn is under my name, Audrey Kevinessia, and my Instagram is Unlikely Podcast with Audrey. And then you can find my podcast with Pete, Amplify Voices Conversations from the Heart on any platform where you listen to your podcast, Spotify, Apple, everywhere, it's everywhere. And then also on um, Unlikely Leadership is mine. And then Amplify Voices, we just won a prestigious award for it. So we're very, very happy that people have received it so well because the podcast just came out. So we're really thrilled about that. Really? You've got new and newsworthy? No, 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 no. We won the Marcom Award, which is one of the top 10 awards in the, the world to win around uh, in the digital media space. So we're really, really thrilled about that. Well, congratulations. Thank that's you awesome. so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so that's awesome. Well, listen, um, thank you very much for sharing your vision and your thank passion. You. you know, I love talking to people that have passion about their work. And, you know, when you said that you want to change the narrative and, and reach more people, so that they know their, you know, their authentic self. It reminds me of what I'm trying to do here, you know, having kind of have people transform their minds because yeah. it just starts there. And once they transform their minds, they can have um, a much better life and live the life of their dreams. So thank you again. And um, any last words before we wrap up? Thank you for the work you're doing. It's so, it's so, um, I appreciate and fall in love with every single person that I meet that has taken upon themselves to actually create a better space for other humans. It's, uh, again, it's not a moral compass. I'm not trying to say people that don't do it are wrong. I'm not trying to say that, but I do find a level of affinity and, and, um, admiration and respect. So thank you for what you're doing. And I really appreciate you inviting me into your space and in your world. Well, thank you, RJ. Oh, uh, blessings and, and your job and, and the things that you're continuing doing and to lift up the voices. I love that. I love that. So, all right, guys. So, listen, thank you very much for tuning in to the Transform Your Mind to Transform Your Life radio podcast and television show. 
If you're um, listening to this on iTunes, um, please uh, remember to subscribe and review. And um, so just make sure you go on and um, support Audrey, support the advertisers uh, that support the show. And until next time, blessings.